Leadership Forum. I'm Leslie Meredith. I'm the Marketing and Media Director for Break Bulk and the head of our Women in Break Bulk program. This is the second event that we've done in conjunction with Break Bulk Middle East to support women in the industry. And while we cannot be together in person this year, I still wanted us to gather in this virtual setting to share stories, to share our experiences, and support one another as we move into 2021. So I thank you for joining us and hope that you are inspired by what you will hear today. In the next hour, you will hear from 12 exceptional women from across the maritime logistics and project cargo sectors. Let their stories inspire you and help create success in 2021. To get us started, let's watch a clip from last year's Women in Break Bulk event in Dubai. Yes, you're a woman in this industry and you are powerful and we heard already you have a different mindset but you can do whatever you put your mind to. And the companies now with the women in leadership, with the focus on that, the opportunities are there more than they were before, but you have to want to take them. And it's about putting the right people in the right job. And if you are a woman and you are the right person, then you go get that job. Now we'll hear from two accomplished women. First, the chairperson for Agility, Hanadi Al Salah, and then Sue Turbolowski, who is heading up a very interesting research project um, in the UK that should have a huge impact on women in the maritime industry, not only throughout the EU, but around the world. So we thought it would be helpful to bring her in as well so that you can be part of that project. Here we go. Hello everyone at Breakbook Middle East. My name is Hanadia Saleh and I'm the chairperson of Agility. Agility is a global logistics provider. We are listed both on the Kuwait Stock Exchange and the Dubai financial market. I started my career with Agility back in 2007. When I first started, I headed Invested Relations and over time with experience, I eventually became the chairperson of Agility. I also hold an executive role largely around digital transformation and technological enablement. If I take one step back and look at female participation within our industry, it is quite low. If we look at women participating in management boards alongside the top companies around the world, the numbers are quite stark. It's only between zero to 20%. If we look at women in management teams, it's still quite low. It's only between 17 to 30%. This is largely because of the history of the logistics industry. And if you look at certain sectors such as road freight and warehousing, where it's predominantly male. But I am hopeful and I do see this changing. If we look at another aspect and vertical of it within logistics, largely around e-commerce, we see these statistics changing. E-commerce in the Middle East is growing and e-commerce is enabling small to medium-sized enterprises grow their cross-border trade. And these small to medium-sized enterprises and startups from our own research and research echo echoed by the World Economic Forum shows that one in every three businesses are led by a woman. And that is fabulous news. We hope to see the, these numbers change and grow and evolve. But if I look at my personal career and ask myself what it is that I can give you and tell you that has changed and supported me over the past few years, let me leave you, leave you with three points. First of all, make sure you have a strong network. You need to have a strong network both on your personal and professional career. Personally, to make sure you're supported and able to do whatever it is you can and from a professional side to make sure you're plugged in and people are aware of who you are. 
The second is to speak up and participate. As Sheryl Sandberg would say, lean in, do not shy away. Your opinion is just as valuable as any other member in that room. And lastly, and this is advice for anyone, not just females, don't just be good, be awesome, be fantastic at what you do, be better than the next person who's sitting on that chair. And with that, it's a recipe for success. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here this morning to talk to you and explain a little bit more what we're doing under our EU Women's Project. This is a funded project by ECSA, ETF and part of their WISE project, which is looking to create an attractive, smart and sustainable working environment for the EU Cyprian sector. We're focusing on the women's part of this and we're going to be work, working on three work streams. They are gender policies across Europe, highlighting the best and making recommendations for improvements. We're going to do an intensive research campaign into enhancing recruitment and retention of women in the industry, really looking at the key issues and seeing what we can do to improve it. After we've done all this, then we'll be creating an awareness campaign which aims to create more career opportunities for women in the shipping sector and across both of it. That, that's aiming to create an awareness campaign for women career opportunities in shipping, both at sea and ashore. This is going to be really quite crucial going forward. One of the biggest challenges to achieving gender parity in the world is the lack of gender friendly legislation and policies that provide women equal opportunities across all sectors. There needs to be a sort of gender spotlight on policies across all sectors and all related policies. And we're hoping some of our work will actually work towards having, making this happen. Language is another key thing for us. We're really keen to make sure that we look at the language side of things and abolish words like seamen from ever appearing again in any legislation or in any material that is provided within the EU. We also think there's some simple wins like making sure that there are women toilets quayside on all ports, that there is a bin on all ships so that women can actually put sanitary products into a, into a suitable thing when they're in the toilet. Increasing retention and progression is something else that we're going to be focusing on. If there's not enough women in middle and senior positions that can lead to them going achieving board positions and then maybe even becoming NEDs, non-executive directors, then it's not going to happen. So that's going to be something we're going to be looking at, how we can keep the good people that we're actually attracting into our industry. And all of this underpins are the aims of the whole work that we're doing with the EU to further in create a diverse and inclusive environment in the maritime sector. We have a few questions that we're going to be sharing with you later on and please do fill them in and complete the polls. It's really key to us that we learn the best from around the world so we don't just see this through the eyes of a European project. We want to work with people around the world to learn the best things they're doing and also to learn things that they think can be approved. Because this isn't a boundary country Pacific project. The same things are affecting us. We're a global sector and we have global issues. Also, we are available on social media. So please do feel free to contact us via LinkedIn, Facebook or our Twitter feed. And we also have a website, eumaritimewomen.org, where we'll be hosting lots of interactive things to do and for, for feedback. So please do go and visit it, be part of our movement to help make this a better place for everybody in the maritime sector. Okay, that was a great start to our session. Now let's turn to our first topic, the many paths to female leadership. You'll hear from five women. Um, who have reached a leadership level, but have come to it um, in different ways. No path, no two paths are the same. And as you're listening to them, think about the similarities between uh, the women that you hear, your own path, and where that might take you next. I graduated as an architecture engineer. 
and I joined my job at the Ministry of Infrastructure as a site engineer. It was really tough at that time, and the most difficult part, that it was not accepted socially to have a female working at the construction site. And by time, we built the trust, and our managers start giving us more responsibility and more exposure. Here where I become a head of the road department at the Ministry of Public Work, and again, it is a male dominant sector, where the female were not accepted at that time. And after that, I become the under secretary of the infrastructure sector. It was not easy to handle all this responsibility while being a mother. But I work hard to create this balance between home and job. And when I joined the maritime sector, it was a totally different area where there were no present for the female and they deal with us as a stranger. But we work hard to show them our credibility and professionality and with the support of our leader, we achieved the success story at the maritime sector. So it was not easy, but with the collective support of our leaders and our families, and our society, we will achieve our dreams and we will become whatever we want to be. So believe in yourself and your capability and fulfill your passion so you will achieve your dreams. It's great to have a male expert at the maritime sector, but it's greater to have a female leaders at the maritime sector. So work for it, please. My journey was very different. I am fourth generation in my family business that started in India in 1905 and 10 years into my career I decided I no longer wanted to be part of my family business and I left India, I left my family and I moved to the UAE um, with a dream and lots of aspirations and I started my own company here in the UAE um, you know and Today, four years later, life is not the same that it was four years ago. So my journey in leadership was literally self-inflicted. I did not want to report to my parents. I was a rebel and I took a huge risk as a Muslim, as an unmarried girl, as an Indian. I left home and I came to, into uncharted territory, quite literally speaking. So um, the, the world was my oyster. My parents were very supportive although not very, um, they, were, they were nervous as, as most parents would be. And here I am today, I have a, a team of 10 people um, and you know, we've opened up offices in Dubai, in Fujairah, we had one in Abu Dhabi pre-COVID, during COVID that um, we have temporarily shut down, but we also have offices in Oman. Inshallah, we're looking at expanding in the GCC, hopefully Bahrain, Kuwait. So, you know, the opportunities have suddenly, out of nowhere, started coming through. And that has been exceptionally exciting. And you can only do that when you're a leader of your own choices. So for me, leadership and the journey has really been making those difficult choices that were never really an option in a family-run business. When someone asks you the shape of your journey, it's such an emotional question for me um, because the shape has been full circle but in the opposite direction. So, you know, I started in a very, in a very stable environment working in India where we have 250 people reporting to the management, uh, nine offices, and we're a 115-year-old company growing. And I walked away from that. So instead of sort of being a linear progression, starting small and then working your way up top, I started up top and crashed all the way down to like nothing. So when I came to the UAE, we didn't even have a trade license in place. We didn't even have a place to work. I was working from home. And slowly but surely, um, with the support of the maritime industry and incredible people that I have met along the way in this journey, uh, we started bit by bit, one employee, second employee, third employee, and then one branch, second branch, third branch, and we're only four years old. So with a team today of about 15 people, including engineers, coordinators, 
we also have staff and back office coordination from India. So we really are a global company. We're a very small company, but we're definitely a global company. So when I say the shape was literally full circle, but role reversal, I started from a management position and went into a completely, um, you know, went to ground zero. And once again, through hard work, dedication, dreams, aspirations, and the support of my colleagues have once again risen back to management to a managerial position. So it's been a very emotional but very exhilarating journey. How does one define a challenge? Everything was challenging and everything was rewarding. Um, I think the biggest challenge, if you really ask me, was being optimistic. Every day when you wake up and the future looks so unsure, so unfamiliar. Nobody knows who you are. You have to establish your own credibility. Uh, even getting a credit line from the banks has been, you know, I mean, to support your, to biz your business was challenging. But the most important thing and the thing that I learned very early on as in a startup position was the, uh, and also supposed to be the biggest challenge was earning a customer's trust. I found that um, I made lots of excuses. I said, oh, I'm young, I'm a woman, nobody wants to give me a chance, an opportunity. All that was just excuses. And the biggest challenge of all was basically having to work to, for credibility rather than just being given credibility on, um, on a plateau. And coming from a family business with a very well-respected, very well-recognized family name in India, suddenly I was a nobody in the UAE. And that was very challenging for me because it was literally a, a fall from, from grace, if you will. And uh, accepting that I have to start from ground zero and work my way up was hugely challenging for me. And when I said huge, and I, when I also, when I said rewarding, it was hugely rewarding because the maritime industry in the UAE literally accepted me with open arms. They never questioned my, my dignity, they never questioned my intelligence, they never questioned my technical knowledge. They listened and they let me speak and they gave me opportunities to prove myself. So that's so, I was lucky and fortunate enough to convert that challenge into an opportunity that was eventually rewarding because I'm standing here before you today um, after creating a small success story with four branches and uh, a, an incredible team that I work with, both at, uh, with my colleagues as well as my customers. For women who, are, who want to join the marine segment, the biggest blessing is that there are just so few of us. There are very, very few women who are in this industry. And so when you meet other people, other customers, they will remember you. <laughs> and that's half the battle won, right? You might forget who you meet, but when you meet them again at, an, at another occasion, because the industry is very small. So when you start meeting people for the second and third time, they remember women and they remember you. So automatically you get a sort of notch above the other men that have to make multiple good impressions. You just have to make one good impression and you have a, you have a foot in the door. So I would say the maritime industry is a great place for women, very welcoming, very respectful. You just have to take that leap of faith, quite literally speaking. Ironically, I really struggle with the idea that I'm a leader. I still feel in my head that I'm not a leader, but I'm still some sort of follower. The reality is that as the managing partner of an international law firm based in Dubai, I am a leader um, and people do look to me to lead them and rely on me um, to lead them. And I need to really get comfortable with that idea, I guess. Um, in terms of the path that led me here, I've had a very boring path. I joined Co. back in 1998 and have really just effectively um, risen through the ranks of a law firm in a very normal way. I can't say that it's been without its challenges or that it's been an easy path. Um, it certainly had, what can I call them, humps along the way. But overall, it's been a relatively straightforward path starting off as a trainee solicitor, becoming an associate, becoming a senior associate, and then being elevated to partnership. I was actually refused partnership twice with INS, um, and in hindsight, I agree that those were the right decisions. I wasn't ready for partnership at that time. I wasn't ready to take on any sort of leadership role at that time. And it made me realize that leadership and responsibility and even any sort of promotion and development comes only when it's the right time for it to come for every individual. 
And one of my concerns about the new world, and as I see younger, and that's a, a relative term, younger people coming up through the ranks, sometimes I feel they want leadership roles and they want promotions just for the sake of them. And I can't say that being a leader is an easy role or being a leader is a role that everyone should aspire to. I really do think that it is something that people should think quite carefully about. I refer quite a lot when I think about where I am now to luck, but I truly do believe that there are lots of other qualities and lots of other requirements in order to sort of catapult yourself into a leadership role because that's what it feels like sometimes, that you're literally being thrown into it. Um, I think that the qualities that are needed really are hard work. You've got to have the right um, attitude to wanting to work hard to be where you are. You've also got to have integrity. I think that's the most important character for a leader. If we, if we look at how leaders, different leaders have dealt with the COVID pandemic, for example, a lot of people are pointing to the success of women leaders. I see another quality, not just that people, who, or not just the countries where there's been a good response have female leaders, but the reality is that countries that have a good response are countries where people trust their leadership. And that's across the board. So when you look at New Zealand, when you look at the UAE, these are all countries that I believe have had very good responses to COVID. And I think the reason for that is because they trust their leadership. And that's always a quality that sits with me that I need my team to trust me and I need to earn that trust and I need to deserve that trust. And I think you do that through acting with integrity in every decision you make. So I've been asked to comment on my biggest challenge on the path to leadership. I think I am my biggest challenge. I think my um, inability to trust my gut was one of the biggest challenges I had. Um, I think I also stood in the way of my own self because I would always try to tackle problems on the basis of me being in that person's situation and thinking, how would I want to be treated if I was in their situation? And that was the biggest uh, management lesson that I had to learn, which is that not everybody is like me. I cannot treat everybody in the way that I want to be treated. I need to treat everybody in the way they want to be treated, as a manager, as a leader. It doesn't mean giving them what they want. It means dealing with the situation in a way that would manage their expectations. So one of my biggest hurdles to becoming an effective leader was learning how to do that. So when you become a leader, or even a leader within this law firm setting, you have to change your ideology a little bit. You have to start to think, how can I make this situation work for the people who are here? I'm talking about the wider um, sort of, I guess, maritime population or legal um, population in the UAE who will see me. And women and men, to be honest, have to make those choices in their path to leadership. It doesn't mean that if they take a different course, they will not become leaders, but they will just take a different path. So I think it, it really is about making the path to leadership your own and coming to terms with that has been the most important part for me. I was offered a job in a private maritime security firm and that was the time when I moved uh, to the private sector. Working for the company, after a few years, I took a decision to start my own business. And as a typical career path goes, usually you start as a, as a startup and then you climb on the ladder, becoming a recognized company in the industry and then you trying to achieve to become a leader in the industry. So after five hard working years in maritime security, we became a recognized maritime security firm. Uh, how did my path go? I have to say that it had a cycling nature with its ups and downs. But nevertheless, if you are passionate about the business, you will overcome all the obstacles on your way. So I would point out three major pillars that are important for any startup firm, that are important for any startup entrepreneur. First of all, you have to be passionate about your business. With this energy within you, you are able to overcome all the obstacles to work 24-7. Don't think being an entrepreneur is an easy task. It's not. It's way harder than being a hired employee because you 
tend to stray from the normal business activity and business working hours. You work all day long and you are fully liable for your team and for the quality of your products. Second pillar is the crisis resistance. That's how business goes. Sometimes you have to move from one failure to another, still believing in your products or in your services that you provide to the market. And third pillar is a long life commitment to your business. When you start your company, you have to think about many factors, about competition, recruitment, uh, market swings, world economic crisis that hit uh, into a... Now uh, we are facing world pandemic crisis that uh, brought lots of companies to bankruptcy. But besides all these issues that one entrepreneur has to handle together with the team and foresee certain issues, I would consider that stereotypes and gender inequality one of the two major problems, um, not only in the Middle East but worldwide uh, in order to um, be an ambitious entrepreneur and uh, just to perform your job in a very professional way if you want to be equal you have to perform equally and at the end of the day your qualities are judged not um, uh, not the gender that's very important to remember and um, uh, I would also like to point out that um, it's very important to believe in yourself and to believe in your product that you provide quality services you do not compromise um, quality over uh, quantity and uh, at the end of the day i'm sure that uh, you will succeed you definitely have to be passionate about what you're doing um, actually my personal journey started since i was seven years old uh, when my father used to take me to shipyards and ports and terminals and when um, I used to spend most of my weekends in the office uh, learning seeing hearing about how different departments are run and how the leadership is running the business actually uh, from early on uh, I decided to uh, pursue my career in the maritime and shipping industry firstly because I was very much interested uh, in the industry and secondly because even till today uh, this industry is very much uh, male-oriented in many parts of the world. I was very much interested into bringing the female leadership aspect and um, showing what a uh, woman can be capable of uh, in leadership of such industries. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I faced um, was that I was um, the only woman in the leadership role in uh, most rooms, such as office, uh, events and uh, meetings and that I had to deal with with uh, people who were a lot older and more experienced than me. I overcame this uh, issue by uh, working very hard and, and not by telling them but by showing them my knowledge, my character and my capabilities. I would say having the right attitude um, helps a lot. Um, having a strong character is very important. It may be cliche, but uh, believe in yourself. Um, if you're interested in something and if you believe in it and if you believe in yourself, there is absolutely nothing that you cannot achieve. I would say to a woman to block out the noise surrounding you who tell you otherwise and to don't listen to um, what society believes, how you should be uh, working and running your business. Um, one of the biggest challenges that um, I was facing was because was when um, everybody when you when they hear that uh, you work for a family business they think automatically you've been given everything when in truth uh, actually when you are working with a family business you have to prove uh, everyone wrong and you have to work as hard and even harder than everybody else so that was one of the biggest challenges that I had to overcome but I did um, thankfully overcome it by working very hard now we'll turn to our second topic, how women are contributing to a post-COVID business recovery. It's been a tough year in 2020, but according to uh, the business experts we had on our business briefing yesterday, uh, across the board, they are expecting a strong rebound in 2021 for the region. So women bring um, a number of their own 
characteristics and strengths to leadership positions. So let's see how our next five participants are applying those in their business today. When it comes to crisis and recovery, that is not something any of us has learned in university or in your MBA program or wherever you have been to. That is something we had to deal with, the whole world had to deal with on an ad hoc basis. I have seen female leaders dealing with it on point better because on some point you just had to, you had to apply emotional intelligence. You had to look at it and you had to say, and this is how we make it work and this is how we can deal with that. We don't have that many male leaders in our industry we have a lot of ladies in the in the hr on the hr level on the senior level and i find looking at individual pictures and not just looking at the bottom number it's very easy if your boss is saying um, you need to cut you need to cut 10 percent where you cut how you cut how you deal with that how you make it how you make it possible how you make now the uh, work from home the remote working I think we were arguing that for 20 years and COVID has shown, has proved us right. It is possible and it's not always easy, but definitely it is, um, it is possible. So on that point, I would say women sometimes going with their gut feeling, what is now called emotional intelligence, has, um, has definitely proven, proven positive. During the, during the pandemic, what one is of course the, the, the personal situation, what all of us had to handle. Now again, coming to, to women, we were faced with uh, homeschooling of our children. So you have homeschooling, you have a very different situation at your hand. Everybody who has worked from home and has kids at home, and we're talking men and women here, uh, we have faced our, our fair share. And I think we were all very excited going back to the, to the office after that, after that stay. So the challenges were, having everybody on board there's people who is for whom it's much easier to pick up the phone to have team calls to stay on board you have other people you needed to look out for you needed to make sure this whole this whole thing is working i think mainly the people who are quieter that was the biggest risk that they fall overboard on one point or the other so to make sure we're moving ahead as a team and we are not losing uh, we are not losing focus for us in our industry maritime and legal as lawyers, of course, I must say the UAE was amazing how quickly the court system moved to an, to, an, to an online scheme and we had arbitrations as well, how quickly everything was moving into, um, into, online, into online hearings. That worked quite well. For women, I would, I would advise, I would say again, we need, to, we need to be a bit bolder here and having the individual at our, at our forefront. I think by the end of 2020, we were all thinking that 2021 might return back to normal. Now, it depends on which country you are in. In the UAE, we can say numbers are skyrocketing. So we are all aware now that for the, I think second, I honestly, I think to third quarter, we will not be back to normal. We will have to conduct the way we have been working. We will work from, from home. We have to be very careful with any kind of social interaction. All our networking events where I know all of us miss it dearly, um, they're, they're still, they're postponed, they're moved away, they're still not happening. So on that point, people have gotten used to it now. We need to hang in this a little bit longer, at least till the, till, till the summer. I think we have, to, we have to see where it's going. We have to see how vaccination will work out, if that makes us safer. Uh, looking at opportunities and try to network in the limited way we have at the moment. Use social media as much as you can and stay in touch with your, um, with your most important, with your customers, with your suppliers. So try to, be, to, to stay active on, um, on top of things. I believe leadership qualities are basic requirement for the job. There's nothing much different between uh, uh, a female or male leaders, the, the qualities what they have to have. However, as uh, female uh, leaders, uh, we stored with some unique uh, qualities like a bit of extra empathy, more communicative, more inclusiveness, and also uh, sharing information and more community driven. Uh, feminine leaders also share the 
bottom line expectation to the team. I would say this is again not a female or male leaders. If you openly share the, uh, our, our task and expectation and, and uh, performance driven and help the team to achieve their respective goal, um, have the bigger picture. This is, would be a, a leadership quality I normally follow. And again, I say there's not much different between female and male leaders, uh, other than we are more, uh, a little more empathy and, and also female leaders are more multitask. So they handle things uh, in a more collective, collective manner. That's how I would say. COVID-19 pandemic was a global uh, issue. Every organization has challenged and the way of working has changed. And we have to motivate people, keeping them together and giving them the confidence uh, was the biggest challenge we have got. And also we learned when uh, there is a, a, a adverse uh, challenge, we also learned that we can always find opportunities to uh, find new ways to uh, handle things. And keeping the team together and giving them the confidence, motivating them was the biggest challenge and, and uh, biggest uh, experience we have had in this pandemic time, I would say. Uh, the whole world has come in terms of new way of working. Uh, when there is no possibility of face-to-face -face meeting, our face-to-face -face meeting is good and more effective. But when that is not possible, we adapted to uh, online meeting and doing things without traveling and uh, new ways, uh, using the technology to advantage to uh, uh, achieve our, our, our goals and targets. And it was not an easy thing to do, but I think the, this gives us an opportunity to use the technology more. And also, uh, I would say thinking little uh, on the next generation way of doing things. I think uh, we always believe we have to, do, meet, to meet people to do, uh, get, get, get the effective uh, uh, meeting uh, arrangement or whatever it is, but it's, it's, when it is not possible, we learned that there's other ways to do things and using the technology to our advantage. When there's an adverse situation, there's always opportunities. I always believe in, in um, uh, taking advantage of any opportunities or not to miss any opportunities. Now, uh, in my role, I, I travel around the world to do business, to, to meet my team, meet my officers, meet my customers, meet my suppliers, which was not uh, since March last year, I didn't travel almost one year. But we still were able to achieve our targets and, and work in a new way. I would say now when you don't travel, you have a lot of time in hand. So we take advantage of this situation. And I would say when, when things are back to normal, preparing the team was very important. So I would say invest this time into training and, and, and development. And as a person also, when we have time in hand, we can have more time for a self-development and also more time for the family. And the other thing is uh, there's a lot of cost saving happening now uh, because people are working from home, not traveling. I would say invest this cost saving into uh, new development and we are looking at new markets and new development, new uh, diversifying our, our business into different different areas of business. So I would say when there's an adversity, there's always an opportunity and we should make use of the uh, opportunity to look, uh, build the next, uh, build the future, I would say. Thank you. Pragmatism, patience and practicality are among the chief skills that women bring to crises and recovery. It's our ability to see the big picture and know what needs to happen when. People are the lifeblood of every economy and everyone has suffered at some point during the past year. It's about finding flexible solutions that work for all in the team, allowing people to maintain their work-life balance while accommodating any extra responsibilities they now have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the big lesson for all of us from the COVID-19 pandemic is that people respond to crises differently and that people's well-being must be prioritised. We've all had the tools to work remotely for many years, but not all of us have used them. I, for example, have always saved documents on my desktop instead of on shared drives. That has now changed. The past year forced us all to change. And as a result, our acceptance and appetite for technology is, is, is second to none. I believe that this advancing digitalization will shape our industry in the decade to come. 
It's true that we are operating in uncertain times, but the rollout of national vaccination programmes is cause for hope. I think the legacy will be the different ways of working we've learnt, and I think these lessons have advantages for both employers and employees alike. Technology is not just an enabler, but it is also a flattener of hierarchies. While nothing beats networking face-to-face, one-on-one, in a room with somebody you know and can build a relationship with, nobody's had any choice but to use digital forums in the past year. And these gatherings can also be more intimate, because they can allow you to share your views and insights in a way that you simply can't do in a large echoey reception room unless you've been nominated as a speaker. It also allows people the ability to grow their network beyond their local community because nobody needs to travel anymore. As a female to start with, by default we are a multitasker. Um, you're a woman, you're an employee, you're a babysitter, you're a teacher. It all comes together. Within this area, within this uh, time period of uh, COVID, this is actually has shown up and everybody has started up to be everything at the same time. As a woman, as an employee, this is actually was my greatest uh, accomplishment, being a mother and being an employee at the same time. During this time period of COVID, actually, it showed out for for us, it showed that safety is the most important thing to us. We always put work as our priority, but within the last year, this has showed up to be wrong. And we actually discovered that our cap human capital is the most important thing and our priority to keep them safe. Without our employees, without our students, there will be no operation. This is what helped us grow and develop. As mothers, as students, as employees, all of them has different policies, different kind of work. Uh, with the current situation, now and in the future, everybody will be having a chance, especially mothers and students, to actually be part of the working force. Uh, the uh, COVID gave everybody a chance, actually. It wasn't just, it, it's more like a bless in disguise. Uh, mothers, students will be able to work at home. They don't have to go to work to be in offices and start working from eight to three. Uh, all this will be changing. The policies for work will be changing with this. Uh, mothers, students, um, anybody who is actually working and studying will have more chance to do so, especially as women. Since we always concerned on the family, now we'll have more opportunity to actually be there in the workforce and without being there by using those kind of policies of being able to stay home and working at the same time. I am Marwa Salehdar. I was the first uh, Egyptian girl to join maritime field. I opened this field for girls after me. Uh, I graduated from uh, Arab Academy for uh, maritime transport uh, in Egypt. And after my graduation, I studied uh, with Cardiff University. I finished my MBA. Um, I faced uh, a lot of uh, obstacles uh, for being a female in this field. Uh, the first one was out of my hand, my gender. <laughs> uh, since I graduated, I had applied for uh, for uh, for getting my uh, my service, uh, my sea service as a cadet, uh, I had applied for a lot of uh, companies, but the answer was always the same: that uh, there is no place for uh, females on board their ships. Uh, I couldn't stop dreaming. I couldn't stop thinking about my future and what I'm looking for, and I want to be a captain. And to be a captain, I have to to finish sea service from second officer to first officer, like a year and a half uh, practical life. And and after I got my chief mate ticket, I have to work another year and a half, 18 months on board ships. So to, go, to get all this time on board ship, I have to get a good opportunity and chance uh, to work. And I was lucky, uh, I got this chance uh, from Arab Academy and I worked on board the motor vessel uh, Aida 4. Uh, it's a training ship. 
uh, but uh, dealing with uh, different mentalities and cultures on board uh, requires me to be uh, smart <laughs> and to work harder and to uh, to learn more and to gain a lot of uh, knowledge uh, also giving an order to people uh, and making them follow your order uh, for people older than you on board ship uh, requires a lot <laughs> and for making uh, those people believe that uh, female or girls or me can do this uh, requires a lot of uh, hard work and uh, requires a lot of uh, uh, a, long, a lot of time far away from home this is another obstacle and uh, uh, far away of uh, any social life uh, but uh, I always think I always thought about my needs I always thought about that I want to be a captain and all the this I'm enjoying every moment on board I'm enjoying uh, every day uh, uh, being on board and uh, every sunset and every sunrise <laughs> to be honest those of, um, of those was my favorite times on board <laughs> uh, but um, women and girls uh, continue to face uh, obstacle uh, in achieving equality in this field so we are looking for a better future for all of us um, Females percent, uh, present per, from 2 to 3% in this field. So if we afford them uh, a chance to work on board or to gain uh, their training on board, uh, I think this percent will increase and uh, we, will, uh, we might be 50% females and 50% men in this field. Uh, so my message to my seafarer uh, colleagues and sisters, uh, never let anyone make you believe that you cannot reach your dream. Keep fighting because you can do it. And um, keep your uh, professional performance and attitude will help you a lot. And be supportive to other women, please. <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad to be part of this. And thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today and demonstrating your support for women in the industry. Breakbook will continue to support women by providing a platform to network, seek advice, and share experiences. We will do it online like this, and we will also have the Women in Breakbook networking group that you can join. Uh, by visiting the page that you'll see on your screen. And this is a way for us to keep connected uh, throughout the year um, and network with women in our own region and around the world. So I hope that you will do that. And most of all, I look forward to seeing all of you at Break Bulk Middle East, February 1st and 2nd in 2022.